I'm Josh Barrow, host of Left, Right, and Center, KCRW's weekly forum for civilized debate across the political spectrum. Today's news cycle demands more time for deeper analysis. So Left, Right, and Center is now a full hour every week. Subscribe and listen at kcrw.com slash LRC. On To The Point, we try to make sense of the policy debates and the political sideshows on the campaign trail. Neither party's agenda really aligns with who its coalition is today. It was the dumbest speech I have ever seen in my life of covering politics. When people walk into a voting booth, at the end of the day, they do say, I really should vote for someone smarter than me. I'm Warren Altney. To The Point has you covered for the 2016 campaign. Find the To The Point podcast on KCRW's iTunes page. From KCRW Santa Monica and KCRW.com, it's The Treatment. Welcome to The Treatment. I'm Elvis Mitchell. You may know one of my guests, Dave Navarro, from his other world. Maybe doing a little bit of television. I mentioned to him when we were sitting down, Jabberjaw. Uh, <laughs> old days. <laughs> old days, that's right. What we used to call a 20th century. Many of us know him, of course, from the band Jane's Addiction and from many other bands. Uh, and the band got back together again recently. Uh, was it five years ago now? Was it? Was that the I think two? it was in 2009. Just, oh so, God, yeah. Almost 10 years it's ago. It's flying by, right? We're here to talk about a documentary that he's part of with the film's director, Todd Newman. First of all, Todd, thanks for being here as well. Thank you. It's an, it's an amazing film. It's an incredible document. And I was just talking to you beforehand, Todd, and you said that it basically has been seven years in the making? Yeah, from the inception up until completion was pretty much about seven years. A lot of uh, figuring out which path to take and just documenting stuff and seeing how to tell this you know, incredible story. It was quite, quite a journey. I mean, we cut the entire thing in our my back house you know so it was pretty much a do-it-yourself we didn't have any funding we paid for everything ourselves we didn't have a crew it was just pretty much dave and i making this film yeah the interesting thing elvis is that uh Todd and I have been longtime friends. And when did you meet? We, we met about 15, 16 years ago. Yeah, about. Just through mutual circumstance. And we're both cinephiles. In fact, if there was an art form that I gravitate to most for my personal escapism and entertainment, it's film. It's we can tell from basically the, the characters you do on stage, kind of the way you look, and the thing, there's so many of those are movie references. There is, a, yes, and there's, I mean, it's no mistake that in the, uh, in the 90s I used to have Godfather 1 and 2 playing on a screen on my amplifier every single night for a tour, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> uh, I didn't play 3. I'll, I'll yeah. go on record as <laughs> yeah, saying right. that. Yeah. But uh, we got together, we are such fanatics of film, we wanted to make a film and we didn't know what to do we were we going to go scripted were we going to go short were we going to go documentary and we just decided to stick with something that we knew inside and out or that we thought we knew inside and out which was this tale of my mom's murder and so we embarked upon a journey to tell this story in a documentary form but we didn't really know what we were doing we didn't really have feature-length film experience of any kind and we just kind of got up one day and started making a movie. First, I'd talk about where the title comes from and the title of the film. Oh, Morning Sun uh, actually is a title of a song that Dave recorded years ago. And I just thought it would be shameful not to call it that because that's Cause exactly when, what it is. But when I saw the title, I thought, well, that's interesting because that's really making the story very personal and, and talking about sure. exactly Absolutely. the impact of that event on on your songwriting life, isn't it, Dave? True, true. And also, I mean, obviously there's a... Uh, you know, there's a pun, self-contained pun, which is the morning sun, the next day sun, which is the rebirth after a night of trauma. So that's that's kind of the duality in the title. It went with the song in a perfect sense, and I kind of fought Todd on the title because I didn't want to do, I don't know. You don't want to be too a, self-referential? Clever, is that yeah, what it too, was? too self-referential and too clever and too cute, but at the end of the day, there was no better option. I mean, it really fit the story. And as we got into the story and told the story and came to realize that there was like this rebirth in the light at the end of the project, which we didn't anticipate, then it made perfect, perfect sense. I think it's so fascinating about this because you somehow think of somebody, I'm not going to say like you, you, Mm -hmm. Dave, who lives your life in a very public way and and all of your addictions are something you never shied away from making public in the past. In fact, Jane's addiction was almost like this kind of magnet the jewel addicts together for yeah, it was a long our calling time. card for a long, long yeah, time yeah 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 so the idea of explaining where they came from 
in such a personal way, in such a profoundly personal way. How long did it take you to decide you were going to use this film as a way to sort of exercise some of that? It's interesting because we didn't really set out with a plan, which I think, other than making the film and telling the story, we at, at first we were intending upon telling a crime narrative in a you know a true crime sense. It wasn't until we got deeper into it that we let the film and the process dictate where which way it was going to go, and it wasn't until we were deep in it that I found that the more exposure I gave to the film, the more impact it had in terms of hopefully being a voice for others. And like I said, we didn't set out to try and speak to sufferers from domestic violence. We didn't set out to speak to drug addicts. We didn't set out to be a voice for anybody. And through the process of the filmmaking and taking our time with it, these options presented themselves to us. And so we really found ourselves exploring that. And because it was just the two of us and because we weren't working with a manager or an agent or a company or a distribution outlet or anything like that. It was just the two of us. We had complete control. So it was very, very safe for me to go down those roads. It's a treat. I'm talking to the men behind the new film, Morning Sun, Dave Navarro, who's the subject, and Todd Newman, the director. And Todd, I guess I want to ask you, too, as Dave was talking about this cinephilia you guys both have, mm -hmm. the fact that so much of his early life, I mean, we see so much of his mom and through popular culture, I mm -hmm. mean, you know, through those films and through those photographs, mm -hmm. and it's it almost weirdly that part of the story almost lends itself to this kind of storytelling, didn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that was the fact that she had that she was a, a model and an actress and stuff like that. That was a lucky <laughs> shot, to be honest. I mean, that we had a treasure trove of amazing film and amazing uh, commercial reel and amazing pictures and uh, to really give a sense of who this woman was. I mean, that's also very supported by the people that speak of her in the film, but uh, that was luck, basically. I mean, in the sense that we uh, we had that and we tried to make it an homage to who this woman really was. You know, It was interesting because we didn't have... I didn't have any of that stuff, any of that archived footage... I kind of had to dig for it and reach where, out to family where, members. Where was it? Where did you find it? My father had some of it. My uncle had some of it. So you didn't grow up with that stuff? I mean, I was aware of her work, and I'd seen some of it growing up, but I hadn't seen the majority of that material for over 20 years. What was that culling process like for you, pulling all that stuff together and looking at all that footage? It was, uh, it was more beautiful and awe-inspiring than it was sad. Because, you know, my, when you deal with trauma like this, and not to get too, you know, uh, self-help oriented here, but for a lot of trauma survivors, the event of a traumatic episode is what we remember. And that becomes the focus of our relationship with whoever the traumatic event happened around. Whereas to go back and look at this stuff that I hadn't seen opened up a door of memory that was prior to the event that was really beautiful. Todd and I sat on the floor going through tons and tons of photos and just looking at how beautiful she was. And I was remembering all these really wonderful things about her that I hadn't looked at for a long time. Because in terms of surviving trauma, a lot of times if, if the victim opens the door to certain memories, they also open the door to the tragedy, which finds its way into a physical manifestation. So we tend to protect ourselves and lock all of it away. So but this gave me the opportunity to look at portions of it that I hadn't looked at in a long time. And like I said, in a safe environment and, and feeling uh, you know, very supported by Todd and just having a new perspective as an adult man. I guess, Todd, it's the point where, because there's a sequence that you use to really build tension. Uh, we should talk about the tra traumatic event that the movie deals with here. Right. Yeah, I mean, as far as the, the editing of that, for sure. I mean, it was purposeful that, I wanted to create an environment where it was frenetic because, again, I can only imagine what he went through. You say we're talking about the, the, the murder of Dave's mom. Yeah, the murder of Dave's mom and, and the night of. Because the film is really interesting. It's almost like the first 15 minutes or so is almost like Neil Young, you know, the Neil and the damage done. Right. Mm -hmm. And then there's this recollection. You know, the film sort of takes a deep breath as everybody talks about your mother. Mm -hmm. and, and then it moves to the section I'm talking about where it becomes really 
it's, it's a series of almost like musical vignettes where the rhythms change from mm-hmm. section mm-hmm. to section. Yeah, and that yeah, that was very purposeful. And uh, yeah, it was like Rite of Spring. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> you know what I absolutely. Mean? And I mean that was I that was purposeful to push the. If you can't imagine what it was like for this person going through this, him being the main character in the film at that point, what it was like for him and everyone around him, that was my intention of uh, that kind of machine gun firing from different points of view, you know? Which also, I think, speaks to very well how the family felt at the time because our heads were swirling with pieces of information that were clashing and bashing into each other and cutting each other off. And I think the choice that was made in the edit there in terms of telling the tale of the night of the murder really is a great visual explanation of how that felt. When I watched that portion of the film, it takes me back to that night. And also, the, the I think the really... I, I think the crowning achievement of that section is the fact that once the event has unfolded, we realize the story's not over. Mm-hmm. And, and it also sort of gives, it kind of the end, I, being a little prosaic here, the end of the first act, but it also sort of gives us that sort of momentum to keep involved in the story. Right. You're beating people over the head with the information, but we had to give little breaths here and there because I knew there was more to come. And it's like you don't want someone to also shut down because it's just too much and it's too heavy. But one thing also is a lot of the information in those scenes, based on the question that you asked Dave earlier about looking at pictures and finding all that treasure trove of stuff, there was a lot of information on the criminal side that Dave was not aware of yet that we discovered throughout the making of the documentary. And that was a process that he and I had to work out of, you know, again, the trust thing that Dave is talking about. But a lot of times I would learn things about the case that he didn't, that I knew he didn't know yet. For example, what was one of those uh, one of those pieces of information? I mean, there was everything from uh, from the fact that this guy had a bunch of different aliases or the names of of people that he threatened, or you know, instances where it was clear cut premeditation. You know, where he there's evidence in in courtroom document of him telling somebody else he was going to kill my mother and my aunt. So there were you know. Nothing that was as earth shattering as the as the crime itself, but yeah, it was just to to learn those little pieces of information throughout the course of this really lent itself to it being a real, real story, you know, and as a filmmaker, as part of this process, you know, it was things of that nature that allowed me to at times step back from it and look at it as a filmmaker and as a creative mind rather than the subject of the film. Because I was able to step out of it. There were certain days I was not able to step out of it. Mm-hmm. You know, There were certain days where it was just so emotionally fueled I couldn't handle being a part of the edit or the process. And then there were other days where I felt, you know, as I guess as the human condition is, it's up and down and all over the place. Mm-hmm. You know, We're never feeling the same way from day to day and you know, my aspects of creative process aren't the same from day to day. Well, let me ask you this though, Todd, because again, for me, it feels, it's a series of vignettes that adds up into a big story. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if, because you're talking about building this thing over the course of seven years, when you just figured out that that was the best way to do it, because each vignette is a weird way, kind of emotionally self-contained. Yes, absolutely. There were times that, you know, I had poster boards all over my room and trying to puzzle piece uh, can we weave this into that? Can we weave it? And I, I ultimately decided that the best way, or we decided that the best way would be to keep it in these self-contained kind of vignettes with a little massaging tool in between, kind of to get you, a uh, palate cleanser almost, to get you in the mood for what we were going to show you next. Although it's a very linear story, it seems so compartmentalized, all the different facets of it to me, so I kind of wanted to keep it that way in a, in a weird way, you know? But we also did put the drive to the San Quentin as a thread that ran throughout to kind of weave the different vignettes together so they had a cohesive narrative. Yeah. Well, we'll take a break. We're going to talk more about this incredible new film. It's The Morning Sun. It's director Todd Newman. It's uh, subject Dave Navarro was here. It's the treatment. There's more to come. Stay with us. Long before podcasts, there were radio novellas. Celestial Blood is the first ever to combine the two. 
one version in English and another one in Spanish. Listen with your grandma, only from KCRW. Listen to KCRW's music stream, Eclectic 24, for hand-picked music around the clock. You can find all of KCRW's produced content on our app. Download for free at kcrw.com slash apps. Welcome back. It's the treatment I'm happy to have here. The man behind the film, Morning Sun. It's director Todd Newman and it's uh, subject Dave Navarro. I guess I was thinking about this too because so much of this is about the way in which you were shaped, Dave. And you, mm-hmm. as we're first hearing about this, mm-hmm. there's a cut to you getting a tattoo. And it's almost like, mm-hmm. it's a, it's almost like the, the cliche of somebody getting scarification mm-hmm. tattoo to deal with trauma, mm-hmm. isn't it? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, there's a multitude of, of facets to this that, I guess would fall into that cliche category, but you know, at the same time, there's also an element of homage, you know, because I would say that in order to deal with the trauma, the more cliche move that I went down was the drug addiction. Do you know what I'm saying? And in terms of, you know, I'm just a fan of tattooing anyway, so getting a tattoo of my mother made perfect sense. Sure. But, I mean, but if you were getting a tattoo in the 80s or the 90s, it meant something very different than what it means now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, the story did reveal itself to be about learning to deal with pain and trauma. And uh, I think that one of the things that we tried to show, I mean, there's the body suspension, there's the drug addiction, there's the bloodletting, there's the tattooing, there's all these, no, there's starts, the sex it's, addiction. It's, you know. It starts off with, with, with blood. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. Mm-hmm. Literally, I mean, that, that first, and talk about, again, let's talk about that, that very first image over the that kind of the opening. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's tell me a little bit about that, Tom. We are f- fortunate to be friendly with uh, a couple that's artists. They're body modification artists, and they do these live shows. Their names Plus, are... Also, even before mm-hmm. we see them, that very first splash of red that could be almost be like blood going into a syringe or something. Mm-hmm. That, mm-hmm. Yeah. That actually was the last thing that I shot. No <laughs> kidding. I, I, that was, to be honest, we had very simple titles over black, and I just felt like I wanted something a little more to get us into this mind frame. The thing that you see over the titles, I use, I use basically a fish tank and put drops in there. The help of my brother, who, who I said, you got to come over here. I got to change something at the last minute, and uh, we put a little white background, a little felt background, and and dropped it and just filmed it a bunch of different ways. But the the text that you see, there's a, a sketch basically that you see different components of, and then it all comes together as. At one time, very early on, Dave was trying to explain to me the layout of his mom's apartment, of where his home, basically. So he had crudely drawn a sketch of mom's room, my room, that kind of thing. And it had gotten lost in the shuffle, and I was lucky enough to be going through some old stuff, kind of seeing if there was any loose ends, and I found it. And I said, this would be perfect to put over that thing that I just shot. So I toyed with it and that's where that came from. I don't know if that was me trying to make some statement or me just trying to make something look a lot cooler, to be honest, <laughs> you know what I mean, than, than what we had at, at the time. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read too much into this. Well, just, I, no, 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 I, it, it makes sense. That's what it came away with. But my motivation to do it was I want something a little snappier to bring us into this film. But you know what it does for me? And, you know, we initially, uh, we initially had a cross between like... Uh, Vienna Secession lettering and your, your typical Woody Allen film font. font. Well, it wasn't the font, but it was the, you know, just the white light, white text on black, which was, you know, initially like what we went with. But uh, what I love about the title sequence that we have now, which is so simple, to me, it reminds me of the Werner Herzog Nosferatu opening, which is just so slow and deliberate and ominous and compelling and it's black and white and, and with a splash of color so it's like you think this is mm-hmm. what you think is happening and then but there's the the blood sort of represents the emotional impact yeah, right so absolutely it, it's just uh it just spoke to and then it lends right into the opening scene which is a bloodletting scene and uh you know it it's pretty cohesive and, mm-hmm. and beautiful. What's interesting, too, though, and I wonder what it's like to shoot this, Todd, and I want mm-hmm. you to respond, Dave, is hearing people, having people talk about your your subject like mm-hmm. this, and then <laughs> somebody who's so intimately involved with the movie hearing these points of view about him in the right. film. 
Well, I mean, a lot of it I know about him, even if he doesn't think it about himself, if that makes any sense. A lot of the things that people were saying, uh, friends and family. And for, for many of them, you can tell that he's in the room at times with certain subjects that are being interviewed. And that was more of a case of if it would be easier for them to talk straight to him, I thought that there might be something there that's a little different. And then there were certain people that I felt, I want to talk to this person without him there, without the, the distraction of him being there or to kind of uh, save that um, authenticity, you know. And the reaction that I would have because we are such good friends is, and I say it in the film at one point when I'm talking about uh, reading court documents is, you know, I can't believe all this happened to him. Like he can sit and tell me. That's what makes you that because you, you're hearing about him before you knew him. Yeah, you're absolutely. You're hearing about a, basically another, another person. Another person. Yeah. A another person and a child. I mean, granted 15, maybe to me is still a child in that sense, emotionally. And, Sure, I've heard the story. Sure, he's told me the entire linear part of the story. But when I really sit and think about it, it's very, very difficult and impactful to realize, you know, be smacked in the face with the realization of what really happened to this guy who happens to be my, my best friend now, you know. And I really don't think until the film was actually released... It was always in the back of my mind that we could scrap this at any time if it's doing too much damage. Is and I mean that- Is that really a consideration? Absolutely. For you too? I think that's one of the elements that allowed us to move forward with it as far as we did is, is, is the knowledge that if this doesn't feel good, we're not doing it. And the intention here was to essentially, before we got too deep into it, the intention here was to learn how to make a film. I mean, it was literally with this risky a subject. <laughs> yeah, like I said, it was literally a phone call between us at like maybe two in the morning. Like, hey, let's make this movie. How about about this murder of my mom? Sure, let's start it. And we just grabbed cameras and got going and learned how to do it in the process. But I think because of the fact that there wasn't anybody else involved, it provided us a, a safe environment that we could delve as deep as we wanted and go as far as we want and all the while knowing we don't owe anybody a release of anything or a crew of people d depending stand in there us. people yeah. i don't know stand in there mm -hmm. with cameras and lights like no that's not going to happen wow it's the treatment, really. My guest, <laughs> the man responsible for the new film, Morning Sun, it's... Well, why is that reaction? Why, why, I'm curious what you're... Because the idea that you thought, well, you know what, let's just make this thing about this horrible subject mm -hmm. and see what, where it takes us. You know, we, we've been talking about making all kinds of oh, things. Oh, sure, sure. Let's do the, the thing that might be the thing you might want to, like, wait a couple of years to do. <laughs> well, maybe right, try right. out a couple of things first. You know, maybe work on some opening we credits for high. some other movies. Yeah, we aim we high. <laughs> anyway, the guys behind this and this immensely uh, realized project are uh, its subject, Dave Navarro, and the director, Todd Newman. But I guess I'm saying this, too, because part of this is that you say this, and it's one thing in the abstraction to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And even you think you realize as you're talking, well, you know, it's kind of a big deal. But let's, you know, we know each other. But then, not only making this film about this enormously impactful subject, mm -hmm. but you're also getting to know this all again because you're a pretty public personality, Dave. Sure, but sure. the idea of exposing family to the public like this mm -hmm. is something that, in the seeing of it, must have had a, a, an incredible, profound impact on you too. Sure. And, and affected in ways you didn't expect to be affected by it. Of course, of course. And I think in a lot of ways it forced me to accept and move through some of the aftermath of this subject as a as a fully grown adult man because to be honest with you i went through it as a child and learned whatever coping mechanisms i had as a child and anesthetize yourself for a long time about it obviously. absolutely absolutely so i think that moving through this and like i said not really having any pressure to owe anybody anything really allowed me to explore myself and the subject and you know, that, believe me, I don't recommend this, that everybody does something like this. I mean, there was therapy, there was, you know, a lot of a lot of internal work that had to be done. You know, I mean, this isn't something that you just kind of do and hope for the best. You know, I was guided quite a bit. But uh, I think to deal with this subject matter as an adult male really helped me make a lot of peace with a lot of 
what I had probably tried to deal with as a child and a young adult. Tom, I mean, for you, the idea of taking this material and, and molding it into a film at the same time, keeping maintaining this relationship, I mean, that's juggling a lot too, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. You can almost make a movie about what it took to make oh, this you movie. Have no we idea almost how, made that part of the movie. Yeah, well, you have no idea how many times that's been said of, yeah. we should be film rolling on this, yeah. we should be rolling on this, because the dynamic between us and the outside world and him in the outside world and me viewing him in the house, it, it was mind-boggling at times. And I think it's a testament to just the trust. And what Dave said earlier, again, I'll reiterate, is... Because we didn't have, we had complete control. There was, if this gets too heavy or if it starts coming between us or if it starts becoming um, traumatic in a way that we can't get our arms around it, we can stop doing it. It's one this. thing to say that, but neither you could actually believe you could somehow like pull back the launch codes and prevent it to strike. Well, I could lie to myself. Exactly. I maybe I wouldn't believe it, but I could lie to myself. I think that what we're saying is we're both very much aware that Nothing is happening until we're making it happen. So we're safe until the day this thing drops online or in the theater or wherever. And even driving up to San Quentin, I'm totally okay until I walk through the door. And you have control over those those things. And, you know, I think it's a lot of keeping the now in perspective. Yeah, and I think staying that- in the here and now. To be honest, the release of it was messy. The coming upon we're going, this is going to be seen by other people than us or you know oh, yeah. close loved ones that I've shown it to. What was that first public screening like? Was not pe- just people you know. What was that like? Actually, the interesting thing is the first screening was a family and friends screening, which was good and supportive, and people were very you know complimentary about it, and uh, I think a little uh, maybe uncomfortable because you know then you know what do you say to someone like that, you know? But the first public screening that we had was amazing, to see people react and be moved, and other trauma survivors and other survivors of domestic violence be moved and feel not alone and and be brought to tears and have that kind of a reaction was really powerful for us. And I think more positive for me than the friends and family screening. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that the friends and family screening, when we introduced the film, David said, just so you know, I'm okay. Don't come up to me after and are you okay? Are you okay? And because that was a concern too, is, is, is everybody gonna just blast him with, oh my God, are you okay? And it's, you know, this is 30 years and a lot of work and a film and, attempts at music to make music about it and a lot of other artistic attempts to to reconcile with this somehow. So um, there was that facet to it for sure. But something that you said a little while ago actually triggered something with me as far as uh, being as an artist, you know, did you really think that, you know, you would not do this or that you weren't going to complete this thing? And I think to answer an even earlier question, the reason why we would think that it was okay to even tackle this subject matter Mm -hmm. is because we're weirdly tortured artists, you know? I think that that is something where we'll say, wow, we were just being stupid and we just didn't think it was gonna be so impactful. I think you are probably right that we probably knew in the back of our minds where this was gonna take us. If we're gonna do it, let's do it. Yeah. You know, let's make the canvas big. Not where, let's get messy. But not where it's going to take you, but that you were going to go where it took you. Where and it he, took he us, brought absolutely. up something interesting, too, because I don't know what it's like to create anything that I'm not tortured over. <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? So this is the ultimate, the ultimate example of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're, you're really getting it out of us, oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, and I'm sorry. We got it all out of you because we're out of time. We've got to thank you guys. My guest, uh, one of whom should know better than beat a table when something's being recorded, is Dave Navarro, who's the subject of the film Morning Sun, the director. Todd Newman's also here. Guys, thanks so much for doing this. Elvis, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having My us. pleasure. Let me thank uh, some people here. Thank Patrick here at NPR. Blake Fight, who edits the show and associate producer. Also, thank Kat Yor, who mixes the show. I'm Elvis Mitchell. Wow, it's the treatment. To catch up on past episodes of the treatment, go to kcrw.com or listen on your smartphone with KCRW's mobile apps or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or if you listen to podcasts. The treatment is produced and distributed by KCRW Santa Monica. That don't beat.